feel like I'm towering over you here. No sermon from me today, though. <laughs> uh, I'll do a formal introduction in just a moment, but first, uh, we want to thank Carol and John Moriarty, who are very active in the community in so many different ways for showing their great support for the Boston Book Festival, uh, a great event as we know, uh, and specifically we thank them for their sponsorship of this event this afternoon. So thank you, John and Carol Moriarty. Are you folks here? Okay. Of course, we all also want to send our very best wishes out to Boston Mayor Tom Menino, who was supposed to be on our panel here today, but as uh, we all know, uh, he's not feeling well. I'm sure he very much regrets not being here, and I'm sure that we all send him our best wishes. Thank you, and good luck, Tom Menino. After our discussion here, the author, Dr. Benjamin Barber, will be signing books next door in the Gordon Chapel, which is just across the, uh, uh, the hallway, the atrium, directly across from the back of the hall. And here's how it's going to work. Dr. Barber is going to make a presentation. Then we'll talk about the book, all of us uh, here on the stage, uh, excuse me, <laughs> on the stage. Uh, and then you will get a chance to ask a few questions of the members of our panel. And if you notice, there's a microphone right in the center aisle. Since this event is being recorded by C-SPAN and the Boston Book Festival, we're going to ask you to go to the microphone to ask your questions because we want to make sure we can hear you well as opposed to uh, asking the question from where you're seated. So thank you in advance for that. Okay? Now we begin. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Boston Book Festival. I'm Bob Oaks from WBUR in Boston. Very happy to be here this afternoon and very pleased to be able to be a participating partner with the Boston Book Festival again this year. Given what we witnessed just this week in Ottawa, what we've experienced in Boston in terms of terrorism, given guns and drugs and climate change and other issues and challenges that nations sometimes seem unable to solve, Dr. Benjamin Barber posits that mayors are better problem solvers and that they should be given a try. Here today to help us discuss this topic are three distinguished Massachusetts mayor, the Honorable Marty Walsh of Boston. Thank you. The Honorable Dan Rivera of Lawrence. The Honorable Lisa Wong of Fitchburg. But first, to outline his book for a few minutes, titled If Mayors Ruled the World, Dysfunctional Nations, Rising Cities, is Dr. Benjamin Barber, Senior Research Scholar at the Center for Philanthropy and Civil Society at the Graduate Center of the City University of New York, Dr. Barber. Thank you so much to the Boston uh, Book Festival for inviting me and a chance to also interact again with the people who I've come to be really fond of in the world we live in today, which is people like uh, Mayor Wong, Mayor Rivera, and Mayor Walsh, and also Tom Menino, who I had the pleasure also of meeting uh, uh, early, earlier this year. So to be here with Mayor Walsh and Mayor Wong and Mayor Rivera on this to talk about cities and mayors is a particular pleasure, and I'm very glad they're here because for change I get to say something about people who have a chance to either say, are you crazy? <laughs> or, yeah, I think you got that, you got that right. <clears throat> but uh, let me just back up for a minute and talk a little bit about the era in which we're living and why, for me, cities, mayors, city councilors, and the citizens of cities have become so important. I needn't tell you in an era of ISIL and Ebola and terrorism and national gridlock in the Congress, not just here but in many places in the world, that our political systems around the world are in crisis and that as a result democracy is in crisis. 
We also know, and I'm afraid we'll see it again next week in the elections, that less than half of those able to vote do vote, and often those who most need the vote don't. And the result is a skewed political system in which the demography and democracy of cities, which are the great preponderance, up to 75% of America, end up in many cases being ruled from the countryside by a minority with very different interests, whether it's on guns or transportation or health or anything else. So there's a skewing of the political system right now in which these guardians of our safety and our welfare and our economy for the last 400 years, nation states have become increasingly dysfunctional. And I want to tell you, I travel a lot, it's not just an American problem. You see some of the same problems, not just in England or China, uh, other parts of the world. You see it even in the European Union, that great experiment in transnational sovereignty, which in recent years has found it more and more difficult to attract the attention and engagement of its own citizens, where nationalist and populist reaction is making it harder for the European, the noble European experiment to succeed. So nation states are in trouble, increasingly dysfunctional, and as a result, democracy is in trouble because nation states have been the guardians of our democracy for at least 400 years. What do we do? What can we do about it? Sure, we need to turn out the vote. We have to reform government. We need a more efficacious Congress. We have to find ways to bring Europe back from the brink. But I have a different suggestion. My suggestion is change the subject. Stop focusing on obsessing with nation states, Washington, national government, and start looking at cities. Stop talking about President Obama and Prime Minister Cameron, the president of the European Council, and start thinking about people like Mayor Wong and Mayor Rivera, Mayor de Blasio, Mayor Garcetti, Mayor Walsh, and mayors around the world who even as we see states dysfunctional, we see cities continuing as they always have to solve problems pragmatically, realistically, and necessarily. Twice in the last couple of years, the federal government of Washington closed its doors. The great, most powerful government in the world closed its doors. Number one, how many people noticed? But number two, imagine for a minute Mayor Walsh has a problem. He says, I'm sorry, folks, next week Boston's closed. No police, no hospitals, no schools, no garbage pickup, no sewage, no metro, no subways. We're closed until we get it right. You can't close cities because cities are the quintessential human communities. They define our identity. They're where we're born, where we grow up, have our children, get educated where we create and procreate, where we play and we pray, where we get old and where we die. Cities really are us in a very fundamental sense. They're not just another level of government, they're about us. And the people we choose with us to govern our cities, whether it's mayors or city councilors or district leaders, are pragmatists, problem solvers, and above all, neighbors. We know them. Ed Koch used to wander around New York saying, how am I doing? Not something that President Bush or President Obama would be likely to want to do, even if the Secret Service let them do it. Imagine a prime minister wandering around saying, how am I doing? It's not how it works. But here, when we walked in, Mayor Walsh, when I walk into Hamburg with Mayor Olaf Scholz, when I'm with Mayor Marino in Rome, with Mayor Gronkowicz Waltz in Warsaw, you walk around and people stop and say, oh, hi, hi, Mr. Murray, what's up? And there aren't guards pushing them off. There's not a secret service pushing them away because mayors are neighbors, citizens of the town. And don't forget that city and citizen has the same etymology. The word city and the word citizen are locked together in the very meaning of the word. Cities are where problems are solved.